can y'all hear me? I have yeah. this thing up. So thank you to UCLA and to the Center for Research on Women to make study of women. Study of women. Thank you. That's study. I knew I was going to come on. Because I think during a witch hunt, it is very brave to hold talks on the question, what's wrong with witches? Right? So UCLA and your center are very brave. And I'm honored to be part of a series curated by a hero of Fat Studies Scholarship, Abigail Sagi, and to be part of a series with people who really inspire me, Paul Combos as a hero of social justice on the issue of weight, and Catherine Flegel as just kind of a hero of science. And then I'm here in a room with Ariana Madoff, one of my inspirations and mentors. So that's awesome. So thank you all for coming. I hope people are finding the room. And maybe some more of us will trickle in. But let me start by asking you to give me an F. F. Give me an A. A. Give me a T. T. What is that spell? Fat. Loud and proud from the belly on the count of one, two, three, one, two, three. Fat. <laughs> See, I would have just flown down for San Francisco just for that. <laughs> that is so exciting to me. Just the vibes of the happy F word going out into the galaxy is good, in part because for the first quarter century of my life, I was too afraid to say the F word. I grew up as a chubby kid in Orange County, kind of behind the orange curtain, as I like to say. <laughs> and in high school, I was definitely the fat kid on campus. I weighed 165 pounds, and I was fat. So uh, I went off to college, and I think for the first quarter century of my life, my way of getting by was just to avoid the topic, avoid the effort, avoid the topic, and that worked pretty well until I was living in San Francisco and working as a freelance journalist, and I had what I call my really bad day. Has anyone ever had a bad day? Yeah. yeah. This one was really, I'll tell you, two things happened. First, I was having dinner with this guy that I liked. And in the middle of dinner, he says to me, I just realized I'm embarrassed to introduce you to some of my friends because we're fat. You get the Facial Expression Award. Yes, thank you, sister. That's exactly how I felt. Angry, hurt, right? Like, bye bye also. Um, so I think like a lot of people who experience some kind of exclusion based on who we are, I went home that night and I think I hoped just to forget about it. So that was in 1993, how am I doing? Yeah. In part I didn't forget because then number two, second thing happened, I opened my mail and I had been applying for health insurance because I didn't have any as an individual, self-employed, you know, no employer, no group. So Blue Cross of California sent me a letter and said, thanks for your interest in health insurance. You're morbidly obese, and so you're not allowed to buy any. Same facial expression, right? It was totally different, okay. So I decided in that awful, really bad day kind of moment that um, you know either I could keep my head down and hope to avoid the topic, and that wasn't working, or I could come out as a fat person. <laughs> Which is kind of a really funny thing, right? Because it's not a secret. <laughs> but I think a lot of fat people, people of all sizes, are actually in the closet about the body that we have, the body who we are. Because we say, well, this isn't really me. In the future, I will be different. Generally, I will weigh less. Yes? Has anyone ever heard that said? Yes. So I decided to come out as a fat person, and that meant using the F word. Very, very simple first step, the word fat. So that's why it's in part so exciting for me to hear everybody here say that word. Uh, in fat activist community, we reclaim that word in part because it's the most neutral, most polite word for the topic of people of larger than average weight. And also we reclaim it with a sense of pride and politics, like if somebody's going to use this word against me, I can claim it with pride and then it can no longer hurt us, you see. Um, but that's a choice, and so I want to just examine what words are our options for referring to larger than average weight people. So what are some of the other words instead of 
a fat person that we use in our society. Zafty. Zafty? I've heard that one. Which is a Yiddish word that actually means juicy. <laughs> Just so you know what you're saying when you say that. If someone is dry and withered, don't call them zafty. Uh, what other words do we use? Yeah? No. Obese. Obese, thank you, yes. Heavy. Heavy. Big boned, I thought I heard. Fluffy. Fluffy? Fluffy. Full figure. Portly. 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 I'm getting it, yes. Plus size. We don't say minus size. Okay, what else? Zero. Zero. Chubby. 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 Is there another? Huh? Curvy. Curvy. Excellent one. Rubenesque. Um, Rubenesque. We get one painter. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, heavy set. Did I get that right? Heavy set. Um, is there another O word? Overweight. Overweight. Thank you. So let me break down my reaction to those words and their friends. First, I'll start with what I call the O words. Overweight. Is that word a judgment? Yes. Yes. Is it a positive or a negative judgment? Negative. Negative judgment. Based on, like, if you are past some arbitrary weight, then you are overweight. Again, do we say underweight? Well, yeah, we do kind of say underweight. Do we say overheight? No. We like tall people. Uh, so I don't like that judgment. I disagree with it. I think that people come in all different shapes and sizes. The word overweight also has this kind of a futuristic impulse, like in a perfect world, there would be only one body type, right? Do you get that out of the word overweight? Is that world ever going to happen? Do you want a world with no fat people? No. No? No? It's kind of a weird wish, isn't it? We want there to be no fatties here. Thank you. It's Star Trek. We're on the set of Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> only an avatar. Only an avatar. We're on the set of avatar. You can be blue. <laughs> um, so I don't like the word overweight. As much as I understand that when people say, oh, that overweight person, they are intending not to be hurtful and to be kind of polite. And I appreciate those good intentions of not being hurtful and being polite. Um, but the word itself carries a judgment that it might not be consistent with those good intentions. Yay, you can, yay. Um, The word obese. Why, based on my sad little story of a really bad day, would I object to that O word. Yes? It implies pathology. It implies pathology. But also, what am I not allowed to buy? Health insurance. Yes, the very word obese is used to discriminate against fat people in buying health insurance and other stuff. So there's two things about that word. First, I don't like it because I would like to see the doctor occasionally when I need to. And also because it makes it sound like there's a medical diagnosis based on what someone weighs. Now, if you weigh someone and you see that they're a fat person, can you predict with accuracy whether they're going to get sick? Can you tell if they have a disease right now? No. 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 You all walked in with this knowledge. I didn't even have to tell you. That's so cool. But we have that idea in our society that we can predict health based on weight. Um, so I don't like the O words for all of those implications. And then the rest of the terms, as fun sounding as some many of them are, zaftic, who doesn't want to be zaftic, or voluptuous, or husky, or big bone, or, what, big bone, I don't know, I mean, my bones are kind of, you know, just bones. They're not, like, balloon-shaped, <laughs> anyway. Um, but they're euphemisms. So who can give me a definition of what it is, a euphemism? Doesn't have to be good. In the back. Euphemism is like a nice way to say something. Yeah, euphemism is a nice way to say something. And is that something a good thing or a bad thing? Okay, so a euphemism is a nice way to say something about a bad thing. So as nice as a euphemism sounds, you only need a euphemism if you think there's a bad thing. And I think that weight diversity is a fact. That there have always been people who are either thin or fat. And there are always going to be people who are either thin or fat. And so I don't think it's a bad thing that weight diversity exists. So I don't tend to use euphemisms as kind of fun and, and adorable as they may look. 
So that's my reaction to the words that we have as an option for how we talk about this subject, which I think is a really important starting place. So thanks for going through that with me. Um, you may have already encountered that stuff. So what's my purpose in talking to you tonight? Let me ask, ask it in the form of a question. If you can't be at home in your body, where are you supposed to go? I don't know, actually. I don't have an answer to that. So my purpose is to encourage the possibility for all of us to be at home in our bodies, and for all of our bodies to be welcome and at home in all of our society. And unfortunately, this is not a given. This is not just like a minimum standard that we all get to enjoy. So that's, that's what I hope that we can do tonight. In order to do that, I think that my really bad day at the time felt like I was the only one being singled out and excluded. I felt like everyone else was in the big, happy, warm, cozy puppy pile of humanity. Everyone else was a real person, and I was the outsider. And I think whenever any one of us come upon some kind of exclusion based on our bodies, um, we feel that. We think we're the only one on the outside and everybody else is welcome and cool. And it's actually ironic, right, that we're all having this moment of isolation from humanity. So if we're all having it, we, we can all kind of be in solidarity around that rather than feeling isolated. But in order to change that experience from this kind of momentary assault that you might or might not occasionally encounter to a kind of a consciousness of an ongoing system or an ongoing phenomenon in our reality, I want us to draw like the big picture so that we can see all of it rather than just the one or two interactions or moments or things that we've had or friends have had or family has had. So I want us to do what I call speed anthropology. <laughs> <laughs> I should run too. Speed anthropology. Is anyone an anthropology student or anthropologist in the room? We've got one. Excellent. You will make sure that no anthropologists are harmed during this process. Thank you. So what I suggest we do, always pony when possible. <laughs> what I suggest we do, that was my New Year's resolution one year, whenever possible, pony. Uh, we're going to be anthropologists looking at modern American society. Who's been exposed to modern American society? <laughs> Excellent, you're ready. <laughs> and in modern American society, I want us to find the artifacts that are words or concepts that attach to the words fat and thin. So now I'm specifically not asking for synonyms. I'm asking for kind of other ideas and concepts and thoughts and whatever that you might have found in modern American society to attach to fat and thin. And we'll do that for a few minutes and see what we come up with. So, two reassurances. First, if as an anthropologist looking for these verbal artifacts, you come across one that's particularly icky, and you hesitate to say it because it is icky, if you say an icky one, I will do a happy dance. <laughs> also, if you come up with one that I have not yet heard, in 15 or 16 years of doing speed anthropology exercises with people, I will do a fabulous happy dance for you. So, with those reassurances, let's do some speed anthropology. Lazy, energetic? Lazy and energetic. So I'm thinking maybe lazy goes on the fatty side. <laughs> Excellent. And we get energetic over here? Yeah. Have people come across those artifacts? You concur. Back in the back. Ugly and beautiful. Ugly and beautiful. Ugly. Beautiful. And over here? Unhealthy and healthy. And isn't it interesting they come in pairs? <laughs> Who else has got one for me? Out of control, in control. Okay, so here we've got control. In control. And here we have out of control. Clearly my handwriting, out of control. What else? Normal, abnormal. Normal and abnormal. Normal. 
normal, normal. Normal? Is that what you did? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Yes. Fat, funny. Funny. I love it. Or does it start with a J? Another word for that? Jolly. 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 <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Slovenly. Slovenly. You know, there's some unpacking we can do there. What is slovenly? What does that involve? Sloppy, dirty, dirty, gross. Dirty! Dirty, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dirty and gross. Oh my gosh, it's so hard to get people to say dirty. Frumpy and neat. And Frumpy and neat. Neat. Excellent. Sexy. Hell yeah. <laughs> Do we have a sex thing over here? Uh, Sexless. Ugly. And then sometimes I just write it, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Not picture it. Not picture Okay. <coughs> what else do we know? Greasy on the fact that I don't know the opposite of. Greasy! <laughs> Dry. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Fat free? Clean. Clean. <laughs> Boring. Not delicious? Boring. <laughs> I love juicy. Not delicious. Okay. Self-respecting. Self-respect. I was thinking of uh, fair or white under thin. Definitely. How oh, interesting. So do we have people of color over here? Pretty much. Possibly. In addition to ethnicity, are there socioeconomic status things? Yes. Uh, what do you think? Lower class for fat, uh, middle upper class for thin, or you could say poor, rich. Lower, lower class or However you want to slice that, that loaf of bread. Poor, <laughs> how you want to slice it. Rich over here, or upper, upper middle. Fashionable, middle. unfashionable. Fashionable. I want to know what specific clothing items we get for fat and thin. <laughs> We get moo on that side. Excellent, the I thought about wearing my moo, -moo <laughs> but it was at the cleaners. <laughs> Over here, what clothing? Bikini. Oh, unpopular, popular. Over here, but we have a bikini. And because you're in a bikini, you have popular. <laughs> and unpopular. What else? Smelly. Smelly. <laughs> I'm so happy I have to do some jazz hands or something. <laughs> I love the smelling. It's right here next to the dirty. Excellent. How about sweaty? Sweaty, for sure. Oversized. Oversized or supersized or whatever. Dumb. Huh? Dumb. Dumb. Well, yeah, why would you choose to be on this side? You dumb. Over here, what do you have smart? Glamorous. Glamorous. And there was a hand? Uh, for fat lack of willpower. Yeah, 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 totally. I don't have the will to resist the moo. <laughs> that, that is an American? Americans, for sure. Thin is the world. France. France. <laughs> it's always so exciting to be a fat person. <laughs> what else do I, I, I'm curious if there are any, I love to ask this question, any animals associated with fat or thin? Pig. Pig. Whales. Whales. <laughs> whale. Pig. Whale. Cow. Hippo. Cow. Elephant. Hippo and elephant. You have very quickly <laughs> identified your husband. <laughs> the animal who is your husband. You have identified the five official fat animals, cow, whale, and the elephant. Someone recently on, on uh, Wikipedia changed my name to Marilyn Whale. And I was so excited <laughs> because I've been looking for kind of a way, to, a word to signify our solidarity. All of us who resist weight-based judgment 
And so we are the whale family. And so there, I invited people on Facebook to say which whale or hippo or cow or pig they are. And you know, someone's like, my name is Leah Manatea. <laughs> so you can pick one, you know, pick your cetacean or your pachyderm or whatever name you want. Over here, we don't have animals so much. Maybe we do. Gazelle. Gazelle. Giraffe. Fox. 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 <laughs> Excellent. Do, are there objects, derisive names for thin? Stick. Stick. Toothpick. Toothpick. String bean. String bean. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, we know a lot. Anything else that people have thought of while I was uh, listening to someone else? Slow. Slow for fat. <laughs> Love it. Have we ignored the thing a little bit? Stuff you want to fill in? Yeah. In contrast to the France thing, I've got a German grandmother that says that thin people are untrustworthy. <laughs> <laughs> and wearing a bikini and in control. I mean, you can't trust that. You know? <laughs> that's German culture, right? So we were doing modern American so happy to bring in some Deutsche. Yeah? I think that's from lollipop head. Lollipop head. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, you know, it's like, uh, especially applied to women in the media, actresses, etc. and they're told they need to be thinner, and then if they get too thin, they're lollipop heads. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Cocaine diet? I heard of the saying trigger? Something that has to do with a drug. It's a drug that makes you thin. Oh, heroin her makes you thin. Heroin chic, yeah. Heroin chic. Yeah. Uh, aside from heroin, what do you think people eat? Vegetables. <laughs> Vegetables or nothing? Tic-tac. Cigarettes. Air. Tic-tac. <laughs> Air. Diet Coke. <laughs> Coffee. Cigarettes. Oh. Cigs. All oh, right, cigarettes as a form of food, like our president. Yes. Yeah. All of the like diseases like bulimia, anorexia. So, uh, yeah, Edo, 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 it's called Anna and Mia, like they do on Vine when they're so happy about them, yeah. What about, what do fat people eat? Twin cheeseburgers. Anything Twinkies. and everything. <laughs> Twinkies, cheeseburgers. Fast food. And all food. <laughs> Whatever makes them happy. Small children. Right. <laughs> children, we eat children. <laughs> sit on it, just for me to come in and sit <laughs> Yeah. For the, um, like, bitchy and rude. Bitchy and rude. Bitchy and rude. Where can I put that? Yeah. Fit. Huh? Fit. 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 I'll fit that in here. Athletic. Athletic, for sure. What emotions do we associate with thin or with fat? We have a jolly over here. Bitchy. Lean and mean. <laughs> okay, so mean over here. We have bitchy here. Do we have bitchy here? Oh yeah. Okay, excellent. Sad. For sure, some sad. Angry. Angry. Emotions over here. Hungry. 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 <laughs> Hungry is a feeling, but I would call it an appetite more than an emotion. Actually, a colleague of mine, uh, Connie Subcheck, who does the Body Positive, it's an eating disorders prevention program that uses uh, weight civil rights as a basis. She says, when someone says, I feel fat, fat is not actually an emotion. <laughs> I love that. So what emotion are people feeling when they say, I feel fat, is an interesting question. What other emotions do we have over here? Confident. Confident. Happy? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. 
hopefully they don't have one. So this is a huge finding. If you were a grad student in anthropology, you could start writing articles based on this. It's rather, rather a lot of stuff. And one thing that I want to report back to you, um, based on my experience, is that if I'm talking to a group of eighth grade Girl Scouts or Chevron executives, which I've actually done, isn't that wacky? Um, or people of any kind of English speaking culture that I've encountered, we all know this. So other than neat, which I should have done a dance for neat, because it was new to me. And a couple other words, these are all pretty much words that I get all the time. Now, who's actually a student in school? When you are studying a new topic, does it take you effort and attention to learn the new stuff? Yeah? So in order for all of us to know this, as thoroughly as we actually do, we've spent effort and we've paid it attention. Just so you know. Um, I want us to, I want to invite you to name this picture we just drew. Let's see if I can do this without losing my, losing my sound. If you had to name this picture, what would you call it? Opposites. Opposites? But specific to this picture, the name for it. Negative. Negative. We've got the word negative. We've got stereotypes. That works for me. So shall we call it negative stereotypes? Does anyone disagree? They are not Huh? They are not I still didn't hear. They are not Derogatory. Derogatory. Very nice. And the other one that I didn't hear? Was power. Power. I like all of these names. So this is a picture of negative stereotypes, negative derogatory stereotypes that indicate a certain power uh, dynamic, let's call it. Inequality. Inequality. Ooh, I like that one. Who votes for inequality? Is that an okay name? Good enough. So we have drawn a picture of inequality. Wow. So when you're having lunch with someone and they talk about how they have to eat salad because they didn't work out that day, that's a, a small piece of this picture of inequality, right? Are you willing to go with me on that? Yeah. So when you hear that statement, how does it make you feel? No, 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 the, the statement of inequality. But if you're at lunch with someone and they say, I have to eat salad because I didn't work out today. How, do, how does it feel to hear something like that? Irritating, annoying, Irritating, annoying. Normal. Normal, sad. Judgmental. Judgmental. <laughs> Disgusting. Disgusting. Wait, it doesn't make you happy to know that they're going to eat salad? Because <laughs> they didn't work out? <laughs> Maybe if I don't like her. <laughs> Maybe you don't like the person who clapped and didn't work out, so they have to eat lettuce. <laughs> Shot in front of comes to the rescue and saves us from inequality. I like that. Yeah. So we all have a choice when we are presented with a piece, a moment, a part of this picture of inequality. We can go along with it, or we can mess with it. You can kind of tell which one I like. <laughs> so now most of the time, when a human being comes up to this line and finds themselves on this side of it, what's the answer that our society tells us is the good solution, the good answer for that person's problem? Mm -hmm. just go, you ready with your camera? This is the hop. One, two, three. Yes. <laughs> All better, right? It's perfectly fine that we have this picture of inequality because I'm on the good side of the line. Is that really what we think? Yeah. So, um, does that work? Are all the fatties just jumping over to the thin side of the line and everybody's happy? No? no. no? Well, we'll get into why the stupid, smelly, lazy fatties would possibly want to stay on this unpleasant side of this line in a minute. 
But first I want to ask you this kind of metaphysical question. Who tells you which side of the line you're on in our society? The media tell us. How do you tell us in the media which side, whether you're fat or thin? Uh, So they have a lot of thin women on TV and not real women. Although those thin women are real unless they've been airbrushed. So I feel sad for really thin women who go into a clothing store and the women's section is way too big for them. The clothes. And so they have to buy like laces and petites and jeans. Like what's a grown thin woman supposed to be? Not a woman. Also, as Paul Kalpos has pointed out, if you think of a kind of bell curve of weight distribution, which is what exists in reality. Um, and if you look at the very unusual percentile on this end, this is the fatter end, right? Let's say you pick a 350 pound woman. That's a very unusual, rare percentile. I don't know exactly what number it is, but it's unusual and rare. And if you went over to the, the correspondingly rare thin percentile, that would be the body size of the women we see on the meat TV all the time. So we're seeing a very unusual body over and over and over again, as if that were the middle of the bell curve, which it isn't. And we never, I mean, do we, how often do we see a 350 pound person who's not on a reality TV show that's dedicated to shaming and blaming them? Discovery Channel. Discovery Channel. <laughs> I'm scared of what my, they might be showing fat people doing on the Discovery Channel. <laughs> I want to see, is it good or bad? Uh, Bad. It's about like how the hospitals are having to get bigger equipment for the bigger people. Right, so they can better cut off our internal organs. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so the TV is, is very skewed. So we learn whether we're on the fat or the thin side of the line from television or the media. Who else tells us? <coughs> health industry. The health industry and the fashion industry. Entire industries tell us whether we're fat or thin. <laughs> So, um, uh, the health industry, how do they tell you whether you're fat or thin in healthcare? They have a chart. They have a chart. <laughs> as if it were true. Yeah. As if it were fact. It's color coded. It's color coded. <laughs> you're red. If you're bad, you're red. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I call BMI blatantly meaningless information. <laughs> Just so you know what it really stands for. Uh, the fashion industry tells us whether we're fat or thin. How does the fashion industry tell us whether we're fat or thin? They're having you shop in a normal clothes store or a plus size clothes store. Right, so they segregate the entire store to be for thin people or for fat people. And are there as many fat people stores as thin people stores? No. Are there as many fat people as thin people? Yes. In fact, we kind of outnumber <laughs> thin people. The average American woman wears like a size 14, and that's where the sizes stop in women's clothing, and for men, it's kind of equally crazy making, right? And so this is not about maximizing profit. It's about using scarcity to sell. Uh, and in fact, the scarcity is, what's the good size to be in women's size clothing now? Zero. 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 <laughs> to be nothing? How is this possible? There would be like no fabric there. You just walk around naked, apple size. No fabric, can, not even a thread. <laughs> you know, I don't understand it. Who else tells us whether we're fat or thin? Family. Yeah. Your family tell you. I call this the pre-painting. Those people out there are going to be mean to you in the world, so I'll be mean to you first. <laughs> to prepare you. <laughs> to encourage you to make the simple hot. Right? I mean, they mean well, right? But there's a choice when family members encounter this picture of inequality. They can go along with it, or they can fight it. <laughs> so, that, so that, you know, if you send your child to school and the child is teased for being a fat child, is the answer to put the child on a weight loss diet or to stop the bullying? So a lot of people are telling us whether we're fat or thin. And they all pick a different place to draw that line, right? So you might go into different clothing stores and the line might be at a different place, yeah? And if you go to the doctor, the charts might have changed, yeah? And in fact, where do the charts come from? 
our government. So not only do entire industries tell us whether we're fat and thin, our government tells us whether we're fat or thin, and then spreads it. So it gets to the point where I saw a billboard for the Cooper Mini, a car, right, automobile, and it just showed the car, and the words next to it on the billboard were simply 100% fat free. Now, in the last 15 or 20 years, Americans have gained like 8 to 15 pounds on average. Some people have gained a lot of weight. Those are usually people who have lost weight, gained it back, lost weight on a diet, gained it back until they weigh a lot. And then the, in the middle of the bell curve, there's been kind of a teensy shift from like the middle to here, right? So in the last 15 or 20 years, we've gained like these 8 or 15 pounds on average on our bodies. But our cars have gotten like 800 pounds heavier, each one. Right? Interesting, which, which, which weight gain we're worried about. So a lot of people are telling us which side of the line we're on, as if it were a fact. The fact keeps getting drawn in a different place. Over time, it changes. And there are really high stakes to where this line is, because it really kind of determines whether you get to have a bikini and sex and vegetables or live in France. <laughs> or be popular and successful and rich, or whether you're a stupid, smelly, lazy person sitting on a couch in your room and feeling sad. <laughs> right? And so I would say that this line is kind of drawing a distinction between human beings and second class citizen, untouchable, subhuman, not quite a human being. So that's it's high stakes. So I have the urge to erase this line. I think that would be fun. Does anyone want to help me actually erase it? I'll just do it as a catharsis for all of us. <laughs> Woohoo! A little clapping, a little music. Woo! <laughs> Woo! We're done. That was all it took, right? It's not that easy because. Uh, well, obviously, there are a lot of industries and governments invested in that line, keeping it in existence, right? And also, there are some very powerful arguments that our society has developed to justify this line, to make it seem like it's a fact and to make it seem like it's necessary. So unless we can respond to those powerful arguments, uh, the line keeps getting redrawn with, with the support of those arguments. And here are the three really big arguments that I've come across. Let me start over here. <coughs> the first argument is the argument for weight loss. And that we mentioned it earlier. The answer to this picture of inequality is simply everyone should lose weight. Yeah? The second argument that justifies the drawing of that line is that we need this line because it's for our own good. It's a health argument. Yeah. How many people have heard Paul Campos or Catherine Flegel in the earlier parts of the series? Awesome. So you've heard people talking about that particular claim. And the third argument that supports that line is a kind of an aesthetic argument. The aesthetic says fat people are just ugly, thin people are just beautiful, that's just the way it is. So I want to offer Briefly, although you could spend hours and years investigating these three kind of arguments and debunking them, but I want to offer just some points of skepticism. And you get a little bit of a choice what I offer you. So um, I can offer data. You guys know what data is, right? Or I could offer logic. Or I could offer your own opinions as a kind of expert witness. <laughs> as a basis for skepticism about these three points. So let's take the first one, weight loss. Which, which argument would you, which skepticism would you like to hear? Data, logic, or expert witness? Logic? Have you ever heard of the weight loss industry? Yes. When I first started as a fat activist in the mid-90s, the weight loss industry was making, oh, let's write out the number because it's so much fun to write it out. 
Let's see, I need more room. So, how much is that? Thirty billion. Thirty billion dollars every year <laughs> they were making, and now this year, this past year, they made. Oh, my arm is so tired. If only I worked out more. I'm sure we'd be able to do this better. <laughs> <laughs> how much is that number? Fifty-eight billion dollars. Now this seems like data, but what I'm really trying to say is that. My logical analysis tells me that the very existence of a weight loss industry proves that their promise is a lie. Right? right. right. right? You see the logic? Yeah? Because if you went on a diet or took a diet pill or had your stomach amputated and it caused permanent weight loss, if it turned fat people into thin people, then the next year they would make less money, right? Until finally there would be no weight loss industry because there would be no more fat people to turn into thin people, right? And if their product actually made you thin forever, you wouldn't need them anymore, right? So the very existence of a weight loss industry proves that they're liars. Because we would, if any of them produced permanent weight loss, we would all flock to that one and then we'd all be thin and we'd be done. Wow, isn't that easy? <coughs> Uh, does anyone want to hear data or expert witness on the weight loss piece? There are some, but we'll move on. How about the health piece? <coughs> I can offer you some data, very tasty, tasty data kibble. I can offer you some logic, or I can offer you some expert witness. Data, data. Data, excellent. Data on health. There's a study of fat people who didn't have liposuction and people who were that fat who had liposuction and now have less fat in their bodies. <sighs> Whenever you do data on health, you have to use these two words that are so funny to me, it's like frickin' frack. Morbidity and mortality. So morbidity is your risk of getting sick and mortality is your risk of dying. So if your morbidity and mortality go up, your risk of getting sick and dying increases. So people who had liposuction did not have a reduction in morbidity mortality. Meaning people who had fat removed from their bodies had just as much illness and died just the same as fat people. They didn't become magically healthier and they didn't magically live longer. I love that piece of data. What else data about health? Well, I think the most powerful data is actually just the, the, the Kuhnian paradigm shift of health at every size, which people have been creating who actually have medical degrees or science degrees, unlike me. And they're nutritionists or they're exercise physiologists or they're psychologists or they're fitness experts. And since the mid-80s, this paradigm of health at every size has been being developed. And what it proposes is that if you want to be healthy, love your body, enjoy good food, and go outside and play. Those are kind of the three big points of health at every size. And when people do that in scientific studies that collect data, in fact, they do that long term. So their behavior changes, not just for a few weeks, but for years, just kind of for the rest of their life, they're eating better and exercising better. And for the rest of their lives, they have metabolic numbers improvements like blood sugar, cholesterol, and um, blood pressure. But they don't lose weight. But they're healthier. It's so weird. And the people in a comparison group who were told to lose weight by classic best practices methods well, 40% of them ran screaming away from the whole thing because it was unpleasant. <laughs> they didn't actually scream, I don't think. They just didn't come back. <laughs> and of the people who, who stayed in a weight loss treatment, they lost some weight, they changed their behaviors, and within a year to two years, they all went back to the same behaviors they'd had before, and they all regained whatever weight they had lost, and they all went back to whatever health they'd had before, so whatever health improvements they saw, they no longer had. 
And the only lasting effect of the weight loss treatment was that they were depressed and had lower self-esteem. And so if we actually want to improve health, I think that the health in every size paradigm of focusing on behavior and celebrating weight diversity actually leads to better health. Yeah. And there's a bunch more data. But um, what about the aesthetic argument? We can actually get to more data later because the health argument is a huge one. Um, Anyone want to hear data or logic or expert witness for the aesthetic argument? Expert witness. Expert witness? Yeah. Interesting. I hadn't done this one before. <laughs> um, raise your hand if you've ever heard of a culture in a different time in history or a different place on the planet that values fat people as beautiful. <coughs> there you go. Expert witness, whether you know it or not, <laughs> somewhere fat is beautiful. Um, now that doesn't mean that thin is ugly, right? Uh, let me just do the logic one because I'm a little better at that one. If you have an entire category of people and you say that none of those people could possibly be beautiful, is that an aesthetic decision or is it some other kind of judgment? Some other kind of judgment. You're ruling people out based on membership in that group, not membership, not actual beauty. Um, so in the 60s when I was a kid in behind New York Curtain, uh, I saw a piece of graffiti that said black is beautiful and it had this little raised fist. And that statement should be kind of obvious. Why should we even have to say it? But we've had to say that. And I hope that it's more obvious now that people of all different colors could possibly be beautiful. And so I raise my pudgy fist and I say, fat is beautiful. And like Gandhi said, you know, first they ignore you and then they laugh at you and then they fight you and then you win. And so um, there are a lot of really great things going on to increase the possibility of celebrating beauty of all different body types. And uh, in the Fat Pride community, we have really great stuff. There's a, a website that I particularly like called Adipositivity. So instead of adipose, it's adipositivity. And you can go there and see kind of hot, fun photos of scantily clad people. Uh, so a little bit of skepticism of all these three arguments helps us question inequality. But then there's the actual process of questioning inequality. So how do you do that? once you're prepared with kind of arguments and skepticism on these three major points. Well, first I would think that the th main thing to do is to notice it when it's happening. So if you encounter some aspect of this picture, notice that you're encountering it and recognize it as part of this big picture of inequality. So people have called that consciousness. Yeah? Just being conscious of a phenomenon as a phenomenon, which I think is actually a really huge first step on the topic of inequality based on weight, right? Because most of the time we don't see it as inequality, right? We see it as normal or even for our own good in terms of the health argument. So noticing it and then saying or doing something to disagree or to mess with it or just to say no, because I don't think, I think in the moment we all feel like we have, I often feel like, and I hear from other people that, we feel like we have to have something smart to say, or we have to be witty, or we have to be ready, because sometimes these moments happen and we're just going through life and we're not really ready to kind of like be on the defensive, right? And so you're not always, you don't always shift, shift into that defensive mode real quickly. Or we feel like we have to have data or logic, or something, or an expert witness. Here, I'll show you Marilyn Wong, she says, right? Um, but you don't have to have any of those things. If you notice inequality, you can simply, whether you stutter, or stammer, or say it poorly, it doesn't matter, just kind of say no somehow that comes out of your mouth. That's pretty good. But I also really recommend that 
you find a way to say no that's fun. Because then you totally win. Then you're not only a freedom fighter, but you're sassier than the boring people who believe in inequality, right? So um, let me just give you one example. Aside from like the whale family story, which I thought was pretty fun. Um, up in San Francisco, there was a, a health club. And they put up a billboard that showed a picture of a little space alien. And it's a whole other question. Why is it that the space aliens are always so skinny and bony? I mean, why? Really? Do the fat ones stay home? I don't know. So it had a picture of a space alien, and the billboard for this health club said, when they come, they'll eat the fat ones first. Oh, yes. <laughs> Which is totally funny and totally mean. And is it a part of this picture of inequality? Yeah. Because it's basically saying, if you go to the gym, you won't be fat. And in fact, according to the data, I've got to the data, when we compare people who exercise to people who don't exercise, the people who exercise are about 10 pounds less, which is not going to make me eligible for health insurance. But I do exercise, so whatever. Anyway, so when I heard about this billboard, I thought, those babies, right? First of all, what fat person is going to go and give their money to that health club? But evidently, fat people are supposed to do that. When a company makes a fat joke, we're supposed to go give them money and thank them. I, I don't get that part. And then the thin people who go there, I guess, are supposed to go because they're afraid of fat people or afraid of space aliens. I don't know which. So the whole thing just really got to me. And I thought, what can I do? And I don't remember how it occurred to me, but I sent out an email to my friends in the community, and I said, wouldn't it be funny if we stood outside their gym and exercised and waved signs that said, eat me? <laughs> now, I am not the kind of activist who likes to stand around waving signs on street corners because it sounds like hot, dirty work, <laughs> and largely a futile process. But in this case, it was total fun and not at all futile. We got a lot of media coverage, which would have been great just in itself. But in San Francisco, one of our local politicians, Tom Amiano, noticed the media coverage and said, you know, if people are having weight prejudice in San Francisco, that's not the kind of town we are. And so he invited the Human Rights Commission to hold hearings on weight discrimination. And then we all ponied up to the podium and testified about weight discrimination in housing, in employment, in education, in access to public accommodations. And after a whole process of lobbying that actually was really lovely and almost pleasant and effort-free, San Francisco added height and weight to its anti-discrimination law, which I'm pretty proud of to live in a city that has that, because there are only a handful that do. A few cities like Santa Cruz, Madison, Wisconsin, Washington, D.C., recently Binghamton, New York, because they included transgender stuff, they included height and weight too in the state of Michigan. Back in the 70s, the state of Michigan added height and weight to their anti-discrimination law because there was a Japanese-American guy who wanted to be a firefighter, and he didn't reach the height minimum. And so they made the very clear argument, and very important, that height and weight can go along with ethnicity or with age or with gender. And so if you don't protect against discrimination based on height and weight, that is a loophole for other forms of discrimination. So but other than in those places, if a fat person walks into a job interview, someone can say, you know, we just don't like fat people here. We won't hire you. And they really have no legal basis for talking back. So the point of this whole story is not to say that it's really difficult to get legislation passed, or sometimes it feels like it is. But the point of the story is to say you never actually know what incredible thing might happen if you talk back. So. Um, any questions or comments? Yeah. Is there any data on genetics and being fat or thin? Like can't help but being fat or thin because of your DNA or Excellent question. Is there data on genetics around being fat or thin? Like can people not help it that they're fat or thin because it's in your DNA? Um, because we kind of skipped over data in some areas. That's one one of the pieces of data I usually mention when I talk about weight loss, when I talk about debunking or being skeptical about weight loss. Um, there's a lot of research that has looked at identical twins, and when you look at identical twins who are raised in different settings compared to ones that are raised together, and adopted families, and all this kind of stuff, the estimates are that 
each person, each one of us, our weight is about 50 to 80 percent genetic. So at least half, but likely more than half, of what controls what we each weigh is a kind of a genetic inheritance. I happen to look a lot like my beautiful fat mother who's 86 and who still gardens and is awesome and does the crossword puzzle. So I think that my birthright, my body that I kind of inherited is, is something I can be proud of, you know? Um, now certainly how we eat and how we exercise affects it. So do injuries or drugs that we take throughout life or environmental stuff, poisons, toxins, whatever. There's a million things that could affect weight and what each person weighs. But in our society, if we drew a, a pie chart, and you know, of course I gotta draw a pie chart on the fatty, right? <coughs> in our society, the pie chart, if you said this is a pie chart of what controls what a person weighs, our society would draw it and say, well, food. Or maybe food and fitness, right? That's the whole pie chart of what controls what we weigh. And in fact, I would have to redraw this and move food over here. The picture is probably more like, you know, that. So here's DNA, and then here's food and fitness, right? Now that's not to say that good nutrition and regular exercise don't make you incredibly healthy and make you feel good and worth that for their own sake. Uh, who knows someone who's like on New Year's Eve made a New Year's resolution to lose weight? <laughs> You've heard of this. In general, are these people going to eat less and exercise more? Yeah? That's their plan? By the next January 1st, are they still eating less and exercising more? They're not? But they said they would. I still pony. <laughs> By the next summer, are they still eating less and exercising more? Maybe, probably not, maybe, kind of questionable. You can develop a whole conspiracy theory about why the chocolate holiday happens in the middle of February, right? <laughs> but basically, here's what I want to say. You can approach fitness and good nutrition from a punishment principle or for, from a pleasure principle. So you could say, I'm a fatty and therefore I'm bad, or I might gain weight and therefore I'm bad, so I should exercise and eat my veggies. And if you put an expectation of weight loss onto those behaviors, that predisposes people to stop doing those behaviors within a few weeks. Because what happens, either you lose weight in which case you stop the behaviors because they were just punishment for being fat. Or you don't lose weight, and so you get disheartened and you stop. Yes, I'm seeing some nodding. So attaching a goal of weight loss is like a poison pill, totally unnecessary, unhelpful, actually counterproductive thing to attach to health-enhancing behaviors. So on the pleasure side, what vegetable do you hate and you never want to eat it again? Broccoli? or for me. Peas. Peas. <laughs> Anything else? Rutabagas. Rutabagas. So do you have to eat broccoli, peas, and rutabagas to be healthy? No. 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 You can actually, what vegetables do you like to eat? Beets. Carrots. Beets, carrots. Anybody into corn? Potatoes. Green beans, potatoes, good. Spinach? Can I hear some spinach? Yeah. 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 So you can eat vegetables that you actually like, and that will support your health, and because you like them, you will eat them. And you see how the pleasure principle just kind of reinforces itself, and you don't have to work to get good nutrition, because you're doing what you like. So that's the health and every size approach in my view. Same thing with fitness. What activities do you really hate to do? Run. Run. Running. <laughs> it's a violent sport when I do it. If there's a guy with a chainsaw, hell yeah, I'll run. <laughs> What other sport, what other physical activities do you dislike? It's okay to dislike them. Stair stepping. Stair stepping. Excellent. Stair master. Anybody else have anything you don't like to do? The bike. The bike. What? Sit ups. Sit ups. What about physical activities you do because you just enjoy them? Dancing. 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 Roller skating. Roller skating. Sex. Sex. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, oh no, I have to put in 45 minutes in bed. <laughs> Such a hassle. Right, so if you enjoy something, you're actually going to do it. You're going to get the health benefit of that without having to have some kind of like doom and gloom attitude about it, right? And so that's the, the pleasure principle that I would argue. And if you, if you do these things out of a sense of, I am worth it, right? Then that's beautiful. But if you do these, these kind of behaviors as punishment, out of a sense of, I hate my body, I feel like our intentions are somewhere in those activities. And I feel like it's just not good for a human being to be living in this punishment principle cycle. And instead, I really recommend for all of us the pleasure principle. 